Hello, everybody. Uh, sorry to not be with you in Milan. I'm Dominique de Ziegler. I'm the uh, Senior Scientific Director of the Fertility Clinic of Cambodia. And uh, I was asked to address a uh, difficult topic, the last frontier in reproductive medicine. Uh, thank you, Marina, for the choice. This is an opportunity to actually uh, assess and describe what is there still to climb? What are we uh, stumbling on? What are the problems? What are objectives? And truly, in preparing this talk, I saw two issues that were of uh, primary importance, that meant three issues. Why do ART cycles fail? This is one. The second is what causes endometriosis because there are new development in this field. Do you know that so far there are no new treatments in endometriosis, but this may actually change. And finally, uh, a new look at fertility preservation. Our first, why do ART cycles fail? Uh, couples undergo um, embryo transfer and uh, they are being told we are transferring you a beautiful embryo, most often. And uh, if it doesn't work, which unfortunately occurs, then the patient is likely to blame herself for the problem. They gave me a beautiful embryo and it has not worked. Therefore, it has to come from me. It has to come from my uterus. And this is the stop point for a confusion. Uh, we have to be aware of that and we have to warn patients that contrary to uh, disbelief, we transfer a beautiful embryo. Actually, most of the failures uh, are due to the embryo itself. And we will go into the details of that now. Uh, first of all, I'd like to emphasize the issue of when should we do the reproductive workup in women who want to go in fertility. And we uh, strongly believe, uh, myself and my colleagues, that this has to be done on uh, day one of the uh, assessment and not in a tier way, not starting to do more uh, assessments if there is a failure. Everything has to be done up first. And let's look at why do ART cycles fail? Well, first of all, there are two categories of uh, problems. There are sporadic causes, which are causes that will not reproduce themselves uh, in, the next, um, in the next cycle. Uh, and this is, for example, what is linked to the embryo transfer. Embryo transfers are difficult. Uh, there may be uterine contractions. And uh, actually, embryos have been found in the cervix or even on the blades of the speculum. Uh, some transfers are difficult, and this may be due to an improper filling of the bladder. If the bladder is insufficiently filled, then uh, there is a risk of poor vision. Contrary, if the bladder is too filled, then this may actually increase the number of contractions, and this may actually lead, lead to expel the embryo. Finally, the skills of the transfers, and there are marked differences among people and uh, often the transfers are not done by the same person. Uh, this is to be opposed to the persistent causes, which will be causes that affect endometrial receptivity. And this uh, would actually uh, express itself every time you do a transfer. So therefore, we will have to calculate that if you do a transfer and some people were to be unreceptive, then these people would accumulate in the failed group and therefore uh, results would decrease over time. But uh, for example, if, implantation, if an implantation disorder hypothetical affected 10% of uh, routine ART patients, it would affect 27% and 55% of the second and the third transfer. And implantation rates would drastically drop. And this is not the case. This is absolutely not the case. 
This is the results from SART showing that after euploid transfer, uh, there is uh, practically very little difference between the first and the second transfer. And this is data from both uh, yeah, sets of years. Um, and uh, you see that the drop is barely of 5%. Uh, Baris Atta has tried to define the concept of uh, recurrent implantation failures, which would be uh, the situation whereby uh, receptivity would be, uh, would be affected. In this calculation, if uh, implantation rates were uh, to be uh, the level of 66%, it would take three transfers. As you see, this is the green curve uh, to actually reach 95% implantation rate. Whereas, if the implantation rate would be lower, I'd say, um, 45%, and this is the red curve, then it would take five transfers to really uh, conclude that there is a implantation problems or a repeated implantation failure. And of course, when the embryos are not uh, genetically diagnosed for aneuploidy, then uh, you have uh, marked differences. These are results of um, number of transfers that it would take uh, according to the implantation rate of 55, 45, or uh, 65 percent, which evidently varies between labs and according to age. And you see that in women who are older, this is the pink curve, it would take up to 10, 12, or more transfers to reach 95 percent. So uh, it is not because it failed once or twice that you have to talk about Atmosphere receptivity problems. Uh, actually, uh, this is the data from recent analysis showing uh, the implantation rate of uh, genetically diagnosed embryos uh, as a function of age. And as you see, this is the upper curve. Uh, it does not decrease with age, whereas it drastically drops in non-tested embryos. This is an important piece of information, and I think uh, Dr. Pietier has probably talked about it already. And this is a workshop that was uh, held in Lugano on recurrent implantation failures, and this is actually uh, what has been found. Uh, when you look at up to uh, three transfers of employed embryos, consecutive transfer from the same center, this is uh, post data. You see that the uh, sustained implantation rate of 65% for the first and 58 and 60% for the third. So there is essentially a very little drop uh, over repeated transfers, indicating in the end that if uh, repeated implantation failure existed because of a receptivity issue, then it would only affect a very small number of patients in the range of possibly 5%. These are the data, and you see here uh, a uh, blue curve that indicates the decrease in implantation if the incidence of recurrent implantation failure or RIF were to be 5%, and the gray curve if it were to be 2%. But in red, you have the actual data reported by Paul, and you see that they are actually uh, anywhere in between 5 and 2 percent. So the actual incidence of RIF is very small, equal or less to 5 percent. Now, we, this is provocative and we were actually very reassured by the fact that um, another group from EV Spain actually reported uh, this year that uh, they conducted in a large number, 130 123,000 patients and more uh, studying up to five transfers of euploid embryos. And they conducted the calculation and in their hands, uh, they calculated that the uh, incidence of RIF, repeated implantation failure, was actually 2%, even less than what we found. These are the, the workup that we believe should be done up front on the first day of the um, people consult for IVF. But uh, let me insist on the last uh, point there, uh, which is the look for uh,
karyotyping, and we think that the cost of karyotyping has markedly decreased, and although this is not entirely um, uh, validated by everybody, but we believe that the karyotype should be done up front because the consequences of ignoring a possible translocation are extremely costly, and considering the, the drop in the cost of karyotypes, we believe it should be done up front. This actually absence of RIV, uh, incidence of anywhere from 5 to 2 percent, is also the end of the antimicrobial receptivity assay. Actually, a, re a prospective randomized trial was conducted and published by Nicole Doyle et al., indicating that the information provided by the testing were even counterproductive. So the uh, antimicrobial receptivity assay, its history, it has nothing to do anymore with what we did. Uh, let me uh, move on to the second point of uh, this uh, last frontiers, and this is the uh, uh, endometriosis. What causes endometriosis? Well, the answer is we don't know. Yes, but there are clues for a possible new um, explanation, and I want to share that with you. We had a series of articles in Fertility and Sterility that actually looked at various aspects, and one of them was the pathophysiology of endometriosis by Sardar Bouloud, and he emphasized that the primary problem is in the endometrial mucosa itself, where you have alteration of the endometrial cells with uh, various sorts of uh, mutation, including KRAS mutation, very aggressive oncogenic mutation that induce the uh, propension to proliferate to the cells which are um, um, flushed backwards to the tubes at the time of menses. The, uh, the stromal cells of the endometrium are uh, also altered uh, and uh, being affected by epigenetic alteration. So in essence, the core of the issue is the endometrium. And the question is, what uh, affects the endometrium. For adenomyosis, the mechanism is the same, and there's actually two variants of the same disease, and you see here the proliferation of cells coming from the endometrium, affected by those mutations, the same mutation as in endometriosis, but now developing in the mitometrium. So, uh, activating a mutation of the KRAS type and others is the common denominator to adenomyosis and endometriosis. The question is, what is responsible for those changes of the endometrium? And uh, what are the causes of the endometrial inflammation? Uh, there are new perspectives in this domain, and one of them is a possible infectious cause. Uh, here is a piece of data that we reported by, with Ettore Ciccinelli from Bari, in Italy, looking at the incidence of a chronic inflammation, chronic infection of the endometrium, chronic uh, endometritis, indicating that it is markedly more uh, common in case of endometriosis as compared to other infertile women without endometriosis. Uh, more uh, strikingly, uh, this study from Japan uh, indicating that the fusobacterium infection facilitates the development of endometriosis through uh, the phenotypic trans, uh, transition of the endometrial fibroblast. This is uh, extremely provocative and infectious cause to endometriosis. Uh, and uh, the quiescence fibroblast under the impact of uh, fusobacterium will transform into tangeline positive uh, myofibroblast, which would actually uh, facilitate uh, migration and implantation. This, uh, the um, uh, demonstration of these findings, and you see to the left, uh, the controls without endometriosis in the middle and the right, uh, two groups of patients with endometriosis, and you see alteration of those fibroblasts. In these cases, there has been uh, supporting data in uh, animal models for the um, infectious cause of endometriosis, and this is a study 
in which the classical and the Maturus's model in the mouse was generated and um, it was shown that actually uh, treatment of the animal uh, in which you implant endometrial tissue with uh, mitronidazole um, actually uh, diminished the development of the lesions. I want you to look here at the results. The upper part is what I want you to focus on. And you see to the left a lesion as it is found in untreated mice, whereas uh, in the middle a very smaller lesion found in mice who were um, treated with metronidazole. The old mice uh, is what you see on the right, was in effect in the use of those lesions. So all of these constitute argument in support for the um, infectious cause of endometriosis. With Cicinelli again, we studied uh, the CA125 levels, which is an indirect marker of endometriosis. In women who had uh, chronic endometritis, as we said, it is more frequent in uh, endometriosis. And these are our results. You see to the left, uh, the women who responded positively with antibiotic, with disappearance of uh, their chronic endometritis, two thirds of the population. And you see a significant and marked drop in C125 after the treatment. Whereas in the one third of patients who did not respond and had persistent chronic endometritis, there was no drop in C125. So we wrote a, an article which actually uh, covers uh, the uh, uh, amount of data on um, this concept of infectious uh, factor in endometriosis. And actually, it's uh, quite interesting that it opens to new uh, avenues for possible treatment. And as I said so far, we have no medical treatment for you know, endometriosis, and possibly antibiotics might be one. Interestingly enough, in spite of all this, uh, implantation rates, I'm going to remind you of this, implantation rates in endometriosis are unaltered. Um, the infectious cause of endometriosis is uh, a provocative new hypothesis. It may lead to new medical therapies. And as I said, there are none uh, that have been developed in the past 20 years. Finally, the last frontier that I want to uh, explore with you is fertility preservation. Well, everyone believes that everything has been said about fertility preservation. Maybe not, maybe not. Uh, actually, you are aware, because the lay press has addressed this in many articles, that there is a profound drop in fertility all across the world, and you see different countries here, and you see that uh, the uh, vertical line refers to uh, today, and you see those uh, countries, uh, which is practically all except uh, sub-Saharan Africa, are dropping uh, below the replacement level of 2.1 children. Uh, this is a comparison of fertility uh, in uh, the 50s and in today, and you see that um, there were so many so many countries above the uh, replacement, but this is barely the case now, except for Africa. This indicates the uh, number of countries uh, in percent as a function of time which will fall below replacement. So issue of population is a general preoccupation. And this is where this is uh, the issue of fertility preservation comes into play. Uh, we uh, recently published this year a report on fertility preservation in France, and you know that in France uh, it is one of the only countries where this has been reimbursed 100%, and uh, this is a recent innovation, and we actually studied that uh, and looked at the patients and looked at how people heard about for the preservation. Uh, this is the um, population and this is uh, the uh, issues of uh, fertility preservation 
in the number of eggs they retrieve. And you see that uh, during the first uh, uh, cycle of fertility preservation, they all had less than 10. And the total number of eggs retrieved is less than 15. It is compared in green to medical fertility preservation, so social fertility preservation in red. And you see, therefore, that uh, in spite of the fact that it is free, uh, all the patients had less than is needed to expect, to reasonably expect one child, which is about 20 eggs. So uh, most uh, has to still be done to talk about this and help people uh, make their choices. A very striking in this article is the result of a survey that we conducted in people who undertook uh, social fertility preservation and medical fertility preservation, and we wanted to know how they heard about it. And you see in red is social fertility preservation and in green medical. Medical being for cancer or other reasons like this. And you see that uh, in case of uh, social fertility preservation, only a very small percent of patients heard about it from the gynecologist. Whereas the majority of them heard it from the social media and um, uh, acquaintances we talk to them about that. Uh, whereas uh, the proportion are totally opposite for medical fertility, fertility preservation. Therefore, this says, this indicates that uh, gynecologists talk about uh, fertility preservation for uh, in case of cancer or uh, in case of uh, other diseases, but they do not address the issue of social fertility preservation, uh, which uh, actually is uh, crucial because women tend to uh, tend to postpone their uh, reproduction, and if we want to uh, help them, uh, making access to fertility preservation is crucial. Uh, there are two categories of women uh, who do not have children. You have those who don't want children, and there's nothing that you can do about it. But then there are those who just postpone and have in the end, a gap between the desired family size and the actual family size. And these uh, individuals might benefit from fertility preservation. It should be, it should be addressed, it should be addressed and uh, by, by the doctors uh, in uh, their consultation. Uh, with this, uh, uh, would like to uh, conclude in saying that women are not appropriately informed about fertility preservation and we as a medical profession should actually do something about it. This weather frontiers, uh, why do ART fail? Well, fertility uh, receptivity issues are very rare uh, and it is the embryo that is responsible for the failure. What causes endometriosis and address the issue that it might possibly be uh, an infectious cause, and this could actually lead to new treatments. They will be the first treatments available for treating fertility, and we still have to stay uh, tuned to see the future. Finally, for fertility preservation, uh, we have to uh, realize that women delay their reproduction. We have to uh, realize that as a profession, we need to inform them about these possibilities. With this, I will uh, thank you very much for uh, putting up with me and listening to those three new frontiers, or three last frontiers in reproductive medicine. And I will say in good Italian, grazie, molto grazie.